Welcome to NatSec Tech, a podcast from the Special Competitive Studies Project. I'm Jean Meserve. It's great to have you with us. The war in Ukraine grinds on and on. More than a year in, it continues to chew up troops and towns with no end in sight. In February, U.S. President Joe Biden spoke in Poland after visiting Ukraine. We're making sure Ukraine can defend itself. The United States has assembled a worldwide coalition of more than 50 nations to get critical weapons and supplies to the brave Ukrainian fighters on the front lines. Air defense systems, artillery, ammunition, tanks, armored vehicles. Our guest today has also recently visited Ukraine and Poland. Mick Ryan is a retired major general in the Australian Army. He served in East Timor, Iraq and Afghanistan, and in 2018 assumed command of the Australian Defense College. And somehow he has also find time to write. His first book was titled War Transformed. His second, White Sun War, is a novel about a high-tech conflict involving the United States, China, and Taiwan. It will be released in June, and it couldn't be more timely. General Ryan, thanks so much for joining us here today. Hi, Jane. It's great to be with you. So what is your biggest takeaway from your trip to Ukraine and Poland? Oh, my biggest takeaway is that regardless of all the technology that we insert into war, it's humans that are really at its core. It's humans who decide the strategy. It's human decide which weapons will be used and what combination they're used with concepts and organisation. And it's humans who ultimately make the sacrifices on behalf of their country. So now that's probably the same big takeaway I've had throughout this war, but there's lots of other subsidiary takeaways which I'm sure we'll talk about. We're told that Russia just has an inexhaustible supply of fighters. Ukraine does not, but Ukraine has the spirit. Um, It's defending its own territory. Um, How do you size up their relative advantages or disadvantages in terms of personnel? Well, I don't think the Russians have an inexhaustible supply of people. Uh, They have a lot of people, but they also have significant demographic problems Uh, They have problems with having lost the best of their equipment so far, and it will take them some time to replace that. Uh, So, you know, there's more than just numbers of people when it comes to fighting a war. I mean, willpower of those people, uh, good leadership from the top, which clearly the Russians are not getting, all count. And I think this has been one of the big asymmetries in this war, is that the Ukrainians have will, they have purpose, because they're fighting an existential war and the Russians are not, and they have good leadership in their president and lots of uh, levels beneath him. So, you know, uh, this is very much David versus Goliath, but it's a David that's got lots of fight in him and a David that's very well armed and equipped for the coming offensives. So Vladimir Putin says he's going to put tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. Do you think he's going to use them? What are the implications here? Well, I think nuclear weapons have played a role in um, shaping and deterring both sides in this war. I mean, Russia might have nuclear weapons and that might have prevented NATO boots on the ground or no-fly zones. But uh, NATO and the United States nuclear weapons at the same time have deterred Russia from escalating this war, you know, beyond the borders of Ukraine or or any other way. So, you know, both sides uh, have nuclear weapons. I think deterrence has worked here. From the Russian perspective, Putin has a couple of important questions he would have to ask his senior military leaders if he was to consider the use of tactical nuclear weapons. And the most important one is, would the use of these weapons fundamentally change the course of the war? And I think, you know, having spoken to Ukrainians about their willingness to endure even that, I don't think his generals could conclusively say to him, yes, it will change the course of the war. So, you know, the application of nuclear weapons in this war probably isn't going to work for Russia and it's going to have generations of bad impact for that country if they were to do so. Russia recently used hypersonics, a capability that the US and the West does not have. How concerned should we be about that? Well, I, I think it's been a useful example of why we need hypersonic weapons, but also defences against them. I mean, the, the Which speed, we don't have at this point. Uh, not at the moment, but we're working on it. Uh, US Air Force, I know the Australian military has had a long hypersonics research program for over 30 years. 
Um, so, you know, this is something we are working on. We understand that it's a threat. It's certainly a threat that the Chinese also pose. And it's one of those areas that we're playing catch up. But I have no doubt that the power of the and the wealthy United States will help us catch up pretty quickly. Why are we in catch up mode? We've known about this threat, as you mentioned, for decades. Well, we have, but uh, since 2001, we've been focused on other lower level uh, conflicts. And because of the emphasis on land operations, the emphasis on counterinsurgency, a lot of conventional capabilities across the land, the sea, the air, um, even cyberspace and space did not receive the levels of investment and modernization they really needed over the last 20 years. So, you know, that's why we're in catch up mode. We were focused on the wars we're in, not the war we might fight in future. Uh, But, you know, we're moving pretty smartly now in both Europe and the Indo-Pacific to update ourselves. Are we moving fast enough? I mean, both sides are suffering from shortages. Weaponry that's been promised by the West hasn't materialized. It hasn't been delivered in large part. Yeah, I think the procurement systems of most countries, including my own, are pretty slow. They're, they're risk adverse. They're so focused on probity that no one will take any risk at all or inject any creativity into the procurement process. And it takes many, many years to buy even the simplest things. Um, so we need to change the risk tolerance in military organisations. That can only come from the political level, of course. It can't be generated from the military. It's true in the United States as it is in my own country. Um, on industrial production, you know, at the end of the Cold War, we downsized our forces and downsized and consolidated defence industries. It's going to take some time to build that back up. I mean, when you mobilise industry, you don't just put on an extra shift. You actually have to firstly message or telegraph to industry that you're going to buy stuff from them. They won't make these investments by themselves. And secondly, you actually need to invest in new age factories, Um I think a lot of the factories where we're building munitions these days are pretty old, the 1960s, and there's new era manufacturing that the military is going to have to uh, inculcate in its defence production. Are you alarmed that the West has allowed these capabilities to atrophy? I mean, it does worry me. Uh, We are certainly back in an era of industrial scale warfare. Uh, War is a, a competition between industrial systems. Um, You know, production is a vital part of how nations fight wars. You know, purpose, production and patience are kind of the big three if you want to win a war. And production is an extraordinarily important part. But we've seen um, some pretty important initiatives from uh, the US Army and the US military more broadly over the last six months or so. But I think that's really just the tip of the iceberg of what we're going to need. But the Europeans still aren't investing what they've promised they will in their militaries. Worrisome? Yes. I mean, the the benchmark for NATO is 2%. Uh, a lot of countries still aren't meeting that. Some are. I mean, the Brits are obviously exceeding that and have provided stellar support to the Ukrainians. I mean, the US and the UK have lived up to the support they promised under the Budapest agreements in the 1990s when Ukraine gave up their weapons. Certainly, Russia has not. Um, But, you know, we're starting to see European nations get together to produce munitions, particularly artillery munitions. But we're also seeing things like the Nordic countries start getting together and combining their air forces like we saw in the past week. So we're seeing a little bit of creativity emerge here, but we probably need a bit more. So you say the Australian military is suffering from some of the same problems? Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're not immune to the same kinds of slow Procurement processes, I mean, at the end of the day, procurement is reliant on politicians taking risk, uh, not just military. And if politicians uh, won't take risk with procurement, want to make sure that every box is ticked multiple times, um, you know, it's very hard for the military to then uh, have a rapid and creative process for procurement. So both the military and the political classes are going to have to accept more risk and change the incentives for rapid creative behaviour here. And how do you change those incentives? Thoughts? Well, unfortunately, history shows that the the way it changes is through some kind of shock or failure. Um, And I think Ukraine offers that partially for many of us. Um, And I think it has certainly for the US system. But unfortunately, you know, I think it's going to take more shocks and more failures for us to really start getting a wriggle on with speeding up and improving the quality um, of how we're innovating 
how we're looking at next generation weapons that are cheaper to build, faster to build and require a less skilled workforce in the defence industrial base. Given China's military posture and build-up, does the Australian military in particular need to pick up the pace? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I've been an advocate of that for some time. Uh, you know, we need to pick up the pace, not just in procurement, but in thinking about new ideas about how we fight in the 21st century. I mean, we have a whole range of new technologies that are going to change how we think about tactics, how we think about strategy. Um, they're going to change how we organise. I mean, at the moment, most military organisations have one or two autonomous systems for, per 100 people. That ratio will flip. Uh, and we don't actually train or organise for that kind of environment where we have these masses of autonomous systems. We can see the Ukrainians starting to do that. They've just formed 50 or 60 attack drone squadrons, which is quite a stunning uh, aspiration. I mean, there's a while to go with it yet, and we're all going to have to watch that and learn from it uh, as you know the months uh, wash by this year. So Australia and is not in a crisis mode at this point in time. Can they train? Can they organize given the size of the military bureaucracy and its tendency to inertia? Oh, it's got a great tendency to inertia. And uh, I think at times one of the things we're best at is forming headquarters and promoting officers to generals. So you know, we, we need to have different incentives, uh, different ways of looking at military effectiveness at each level uh, that aren't uh, with a peacetime mindset. I, I think most of us still very much have a peacetime mindset, whether it's training, whether it's um, how we manage people's careers, whether it is how we procure things, how whether we take risk in how we engage with allies. So, you know, I, I think we've got some way to go yet, but fundamentally it's a shift from a peacetime culture to a pre-war culture, and we've got some way to go there. So you've mentioned emerging technologies. Are there one or two in particular that really concern you? Yeah, I think autonomous systems is a leading edge capability that we're still really struggling with for a few reasons. Firstly, there's a whole lot of tradition and cultural baggage around people fighting. And, you know, uh, air forces and navies have pilots who uh, fly aircraft, and they're you know they're not a lot willing to give up that that function. Um, same with armies, with helicopters. But you know, in the ground environment, we're going to see a explosion, a Cambrian explosion of autonomous ground systems in the coming decades. That's going to take uh, some real thinking through how to address it. Not just because it has organisational and doctrinal challenges but because a lot of these autonomous systems have a level of intelligence, which means they're not tools that humans are using. They are machines that humans are partnering with. Um, and that's going to require wholesale change to our training culture because we don't train humans to partner with machines. We train them to use them. So there, there's a whole range of cultural implications of these new technologies that are coming along, particularly autonomous systems. And artificial intelligence and some of the really clever algorithms that we'll use for, you know, tactical decision support, logistic support, personnel management, and a whole range of strategic functions will probably have similar uh, challenges. Do you think that military leadership has bought into that, that they're on the same page you are? I think they understand the challenges, but, uh, you know, one of the great things about being a retired general officer is, you know, <laughs> I don't have to balance the day-to-day -day problems that, you know, service chiefs have every day. You know, they, they're fighting in the, in the one-minute battle, in the day battle, in the month and in the years and the decades. And it's an extraordinarily difficult and challenging uh, undertaking as a service chief. And then, you know, you have all the political challenges as well, because as a service chief, you must... Uh, be politically aware, not political, but politically aware, uh, and be able to work with in the United States Congress and others to ensure that your service has the right modernization funding. Australia did just strike a deal to buy US nuclear powered submarines, and then it's going to build its own from UK plans. We hope. Uh, you hope? <laughs> why, why are you not certain? It's a long way in the future, let's just say that. And they're needed quickly. Hmm. Uh, they're needed in the next decade, but we won't have them in that decade. That's a huge vulnerability for Australia, is it not? It's a pretty big gap. And the way I look at the AUKUS submarine deal and the forthcoming Defence Strategic Review is the AUKUS submarine is the long-term 
security approach, whereas the Defence Strategic Review, I think, will be the short and medium term. So my sense is it will attempt to fill that gap with long-range strike capabilities. Uh, There's various ways you might be able to do that. So the the Defence Strategic Review really is the risk mitigator over the next decade as we wait in the longer term for these nuclear submarines to arrive. What specifically are you going to be looking for in the Defence Strategic Review? Well, I'll be looking at the bottom line number of percentage of GDP we're going to spend on defence. I mean, that that will be a fundamental indication of how serious the government is about redressing some of the weaknesses in long-range strike, in lethality, in size, and uh, homeland protection. So, you know, if, if it has a number of two in front of it, that would indicate to me we're probably not as serious as we need to be. It probably needs to have at least a three in front of it. We've just seen the Japanese double their GDP, Uh, spent on defence. I mean, that is a stunning development in December last year. Uh, And we're going to have to make some very, very tough choices about budget priorities over the next two decades to fund a larger, more lethal, more deployable Australian defence force across all the five domains it wants to work in. What's the current number? How much is Australia spending now as a percentage of GDP? It spends about 2.1% of GDP. So it certainly meets the NATO standard, even though we're not in NATO. And we've been at that for a little while now. And it's slowly growing, but it's going to have to grow more quickly. Uh, and it's going to have to grow probably to beyond 3% if we're going to afford nuclear submarines, as well as a longer range strike conventional deterrent for our nation. So the threat for you is clearly China. Uh, Much has been written, much has been said about the lessons China may be taking away from the war in Ukraine. What do you think they are? Well, China is very good at looking at the lessons of wars. I mean, their study of the 1991 Gulf War fundamentally changed how they saw military operations. And what we're seeing now really is the outcome of 30 years of transformation because of what they saw with innovation in, you know, networking, in precision, joint warfare, these kind of things. I think the lessons of Ukraine have confirmed a lot of the lessons around joint integration, about digital battle command and control, uh, around precision warfare, but also around long-range strike and deterrence. Um, But they've also learned the lessons of strategic influence, um, both for their use, but also to deny it to an adversary. I mean, if the Chinese were to try something with Ukraine, I'm sorry, with Taiwan, I think they would be doing everything in their power to make sure the Taiwan president didn't become a latter-day Zelensky. What do you think the odds are that we're going to see military action by China against Taiwan? Uh, You know, I think by the end of this decade, uh, you know, there's probably a 50-50 chance. I wouldn't put it any higher than that. Um, You know, President Xi, since he assumed the presidency, has been very clear about Taiwan's future within China. He's been very clear about his aspirations for the People's Liberation Army and all the various elements of it. You know, he's commenced a fairly significant build-up of his nuclear deterrent. Um, So, you know, I I look at uh, the historical narratives that he's using about Taiwan, and then you compare them with Putin's historical narratives over the last decade about Ukraine, and there's some very close parallels about how these authoritarian leaders use historical narratives to justify military operations against small neighboring democracies. So we started this conversation talking about deterrence. Do you think that Australia and its allies can muster enough of a force to be a deterrent to Chinese military action against Taiwan? Well, I think we're going to have to. Um, It's not whether we want to, we're going to have to. But I also think it's our deterrence has to be uh, well beyond just military. I think uh, diplomatic and economic have to be part of the deterrence posture of uh, the United States and its partners in the Indo-Pacific, particularly Japan, Australia, the Philippines and others. Um, You know, as we've seen in this war, economics uh, has a really important part to play in warfare. I mean, you can't fight a war if you don't have money. You can't build new weapons if you don't have the new technologies coming in. And I think that the Chinese will be looking at that, but I also think the United States will be looking at it closely and ensuring that its deterrence framework to ensure the Chinese don't do something catastrophic in Taiwan incorporates uh, economic measures. So we just had a meeting of President Putin and President Xi. Um, 
as far as we know, weapons are not being shipped from China to Russia at this point in time. What do you guess is going to happen going forward? I think, you know, Xi has been a bit embarrassed, not so much by the fact that Russia invaded Ukraine, but they've made such a mess of it. Um, You know, I think that Russia has really had to um, rescope its aspirations for the partnership. If you read the joint declaration that came out of it, the biggest winner was certainly China. Now, I don't think that makes Russia a vassal state, not at all. I think Russia still has some cards to play. I mean, you know, when you own such large energy reserves and China needs it, you still have some leverage in the relationship. But it's clearly not enough at this point in time for the Russians to be able to source large amounts of munitions and replacement weapons from the Chinese. I think the Chinese want to uh, portray themselves as a even broker, even though we know they're not, um, and also portray themselves as a potential replacement for the US in the international system in being a guarantor for security for many countries and being the kind of country that fixes security problems in other parts of the world. Russia, in the meantime, is getting help from Iran, from North Korea, given the fact that it does have weaponry still coming to it despite efforts by the U.S. to impose uh, sanctions. What do you think are the prospects for an end to the conflict in Ukraine? Well, you've got two big countries, neither of which want to step back at the moment. Uh, and for Ukraine, this is existential, so it can't afford to give up at all. So I don't see a quick end to this. Uh, And at the end of the day, even if Ukraine does eject Russia from its territory uh, and it defeats them, um, it has an ongoing security challenge uh, with Russia being right next door, with Belarus to a lesser degree. So it's not over when it's over, unfortunately. I mean, it's a tragedy of this war that even if they win, there could well be another war in the next five or ten years if Russia does not give up on these imperial you know, colonial pretensions that it still retains uh, because it's reaching back into the Soviet era. So I think, can the Ukrainians win? Absolutely, but it will require uh, ongoing security guarantees. It will require assistance with reconstruction and economic development. Um, And it will require, you know, a lot of work to try and shape Russia's aspirations in Europe and Asia in the coming decades. If indeed the scenario you lay out comes to pass and there is some sort of uh, military or other um, resolution to the conflict, does Putin stay in power? I don't see why not, actually. I mean, Russia has lost a lot of wars uh, when it's fought by itself. And I, I think he has the potential that, you know, particularly his narrative at the moment that Russia is fighting NATO, that gives him an escape clause with the Russian people where he can tell them, hey, it wasn't the Ukrainians that beat us, it was the might of NATO that actually beat us. So that gives him, I'm not sure whether it gives him a get-out-of-jail-free card, but, you know, I think he's got a good chance of staying on in power. He's as repulsive and unethical as he is. He's cunning, and he's been able to uh, keep power in Russia for over two decades now, and I'm sure he has a plan for the worst case um, coming out of this war. So let's talk about your next book, White Sun War. It's a novel, but it is about conflict between China, Taiwan, and the U.S. Tell us, if you would, a little bit about the plot and about the conclusion. (laughs) How does it end? Well, uh, I won't tell you how it ends because no one will buy it then. (laughs) Um, But, you know, I, I wrote it as a novel because narratives are very powerful getting through to a wider array of people. And my ultimate aim of writing this book was to try and portray what a catastrophe such a war would be for not just the Western Pacific, but I think globally. It would be a human catastrophe. It would be an economic catastrophe uh, for everyone involved. So I wouldn't go so far and say it's a catch-22 anti-war novel, but it's certainly not anything that is designed to glorify war or or is pro-war in any way whatsoever. You know, I wrote it uh, very similar to the style of The Killer Angels, Michael Shara's Pulitzer winning uh, book in 1974. It's a brilliant book about the Battle of Gettysburg. And, you know, for me, it was about characters who are leading uh, new kinds of organisations, uh, marine littoral regiments, um, space command, orbital warfare teams, 
uh, human machine teams in, in cavalry organisations. And it's about their stories and how they deal not just with the challenges uh, and the ambiguity and the, the pain and, and terror of warfare, but how they deal with new technologies and how they change how they think, how they fight, and how they lead their people. Are you hoping that in writing this book, you will create change? Well, I, I hope people will think about, uh, one, the, the scenario itself, but also think about their organisations and maybe break down some of the tradition and barriers towards some of these new technologies, especially AI and uh, autonomous systems across all, all the different environments. So I think that's important. I mean, as Peter Singer says, you know, I've kind of uh, shredded up the vegetables for my kid's milkshake with this book. It might be a novel, but there's a whole lot of research behind it. Uh, that ho- hopefully will inform people, uh, but also, uh, you know, portray to them that uh, we've learned a lot from Ukraine, uh, but we, we still haven't learned enough to try and avoid war in the future just yet. And out of curiosity, in your book, how does the Australian army acquit itself? Uh, it, it certainly turns up, uh, but it's certainly a, a minor player in the in the whole scheme of things. Uh, you know, the, the US military, the Chinese military and the Taiwanese are, are the big players here, particularly the Taiwanese. They have the most at stake here, of course. Uh, and, you know, I look at some of the previous ways the Taiwanese have looked at their defence, um, the overall defence concept from 2017 and how it went, some of the more recent statements in their uh, national defence strategy last year. So, you know, it might have been a novel and I might, might have made some stuff up, but there's a lot of factual research that's also gone into it as well. And Taiwan has made a lot of investment in its military of late. It has, but it's still, you know, only spending about 2% of its GDP. Uh, before the war, Ukraine was spending between 3 and 4% of its GDP. It had transformed itself since 2014. And I think the really interesting question about that, uh, given the increasing capability of the Ukrainians, is uh, are there circumstances where you just can't deter some people? Um, I don't know whether Putin could have been deterred from this course of action. And I'm not sure whether Xi can be deterred from what he would like to do with Taiwan. Clearly, he would like to take it back without fighting. I just can't see that happening. Um, So, you know, uh, it, it worries me that potentially some of these authoritarian leaders aren't deterrable. Major General Mick Ryan, formerly of the Australian Army, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks, Jane. It's been wonderful talking to you. And thanks to our audience for tuning in to NatSec Tech from the Special Competitive Studies Project. We hope you'll join us again. I'm Jean Meserve. Take care. <laughs>